Welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming to our opening session at this year's TAP conference. Uh, we're excited uh, to have a terrific speaker uh, today, uh, Michael Ray Newman. And to introduce Michael, Christy Sutterfield. Welcome, welcome. We're so glad you're here. And so I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Michael Ray Newman. Uh, Michael Ray and his wife, Carrie, are here. Carrie, where are you? I saw you come in. Where'd you go? There she is. They just uh, celebrated their wedding anniversary in June. They've been married 26 years. They live in, way to go. <laughs> they um, live in Middle Othian, Texas, and they have three kiddos, 25, 23, and 9. And I looked at Carrie and said, oh my goodness. She goes, yes, 9. <laughs> and I think that child probably rules the roost at their house. Um, Michael Ray is a businessman and um, an entrepreneur by heart. And he has so much to share with us today. He is, he was named CEO of Zig Ziglar International in September of last year. He's been with Zig Ziglar for two years. And without further, and he's just a, a family guy. I asked him, I said, if there's one thing you wanted your, your, the audience to know about you, and he loves his wife and he loves his kids, and he's still trying to decide what he wants to do with his life. I said, welcome to the crowd. So without further ado, will you help me welcome Michael Ray Newman to the podium? <laughs> oh, you like $5? $5? Yeah. I want 50 <laughs> Okay, okay. Appreciate you having me. Well, I appreciate that. And my wife's probably going to get more applause than I did. I will all night. So uh, Nobody came in the front row, so I'm going to have to get down to you guys in just a minute. I'm not really good with podiums and stuff, but uh, how's everyone doing this evening? Oh, hold on. Let me start back over. Let me start over again. Welcome to the TAAHP 2016 kickoff. How's everybody doing this evening? <laughs> all right. Much better. Now, have you, uh, who here by the show of hands have heard of the name Mr. Zig Ziglar? Oh, I got a home field advantage here, guys. This is going to be, this is going to be a slam dunk. I want you to help me uh, pay tribute to Mr. Ziglar. Mr. Ziglar impacted over 250 million people worldwide while he was alive. He passed away three years ago. Through his books, his audio and visual tapes, you've had some, his coaching, his training, and in and, and events like this, except he spoke to like 50,000, <laughs> 80,000, and 100,000. Every time that he would walk up into a front of a room, he would ask them just that. How you guys doing? And everybody would kind of say, oh, pretty good. And then he would ask them again, that was good, how y'all doing? And then he would, they would do it a little more enthusiastically. And the third time, he would ask everyone to stand. So I want you to help me pay tribute to him. This is only going to hurt for a minute. <laughs> would everybody please stand up for real quick? And then Mr. Ziegler would, all, would say, he would say, now I'm going to ask you guys one more time how you are doing. And when I do, please give me back an enthusiastic, better than good. Okay? Everybody handle that? How's everybody doing this evening? No, 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 no. You're supposed to say better than good. Okay? I wonder if he ever had that happen. <laughs> but I appreciate the energy, no doubt. Okay, I'm, I want you guys to say better than good. How's everyone doing this evening? Better than good. <laughs> Very good. Now you can have a seat. Thank you. I'm not very good at directions. i got to work on my uh, directions here, right? Now, notice as you sit down and I look around at you, you guys are smiling, right? Did you notice the energy go up just a little bit and everything is a little bit better and yourself, you feel a little bit better, right? They say that the first interaction of your day impacts the rest of your day, negative or positive. The first interaction you have with another person, well, the first interaction that you have in your day is with you, right? So we can control and there's so many times that we get up so, early, so late, you sleep that extra five minutes, the kids are in, the spouse is in, the phone is ringing. The first thing we do within 24 inches always is what? I didn't even do this. I did this. And you are going, oh, yeah, I get it. You pick the phone up, right? We start our day like that. So I can, I'm going to give you some really good takeaways today. And what I really want to do is disrupt, disrupt your thinking. Mr. Ziegler was, was the best salesperson in my mind, leadership trainer and motivator of our time. And he says in sales, that's where he started was, he was proud to be a salesperson. What he did was disrupt your thinking. If I can mentally push you off balance for a second, mentally, you're gonna, it leaves you open to learning 
and retention. So today, a couple times, I'm going to go like this. That means I just said something that's kind of crazy. The attention span they found out in 2015 of a goldfish is nine seconds. You know it's coming. The attention span of a human as of last year, 2015, eight seconds. What? That's crazy, right? And you'll find out pretty quick that I speak about 280 words a minute with gust up to 550. <laughs> it doesn't take long, so you guys are going to try to keep up. Even though I do everything I can, I'll walk around, jump around, and ask questions to you guys and try to hold your attention. You're going to make a trip to the ladies' room, to the men's room. You're going to check in on the kids, mentally or physically. You're going to pick up, get on your social media. That's a real quick, make sure your phone's turned, don't vibrate. Mine is. Now, we're good, right? Take a bow. This young lady, is this, do you know her? Do you know she ran my dry cleaners for about a year when she worked there for me? She's one of my college girls. Oh, my God. I was like, what? I know you. So I'm sorry. I, okay, that's goldfish moment for me. That was a go, go, I'm sorry. I just looked back there and saw you. How you doing? I know you're blushing now. You love talking, right? Anyway, what I want to do is I want to knock you guys off balance list. What I want to disrupt your thinking. If I can disrupt your thinking, I can open you up for learning and retention. You're going to do three things as we talk through today. You're going to educate, validate, or both. Now think about when you educate. Every time you learn something or do anything, you educate. Oh, I just learned that. Yeah, that's good. I can put that in play because we get our degrees, right? We get our degrees in life. We learn, but we never, ever graduate from learning. We always educate ourselves. Validate's the second thing we're going to do. As we validate ourselves, that's like, oh, yeah, I do that. I've done a lot of that over the last five years because I'm severely dyslexic, which I'll get into in a minute, and I never read, learned, listened, or anything. I spent my whole life doing everything the hard way. Man, the last five years have been awesome for me because I've been like, oh, I do that. All right. All right. Well, that's good to learn. I put that in play. The third thing, you'll educate, validate. Now, what does that mean? That means you're going to educate. You go to something you forgot and you used to do, you put it in play, right? They say motivation, and I'm going to touch the stu- information I give you today, I'm pretty fired up about because it will change your life if you let it. And I get upset about people. Oh, positive attitude will let you do anything. You can do anything, positive attitude. That's not true. I'm the po- most positive guy you'll meet today promise. You don't want me taking your tonsils out. (laughs) Even if I tell you I can do it, because I promise you, I can't. But what happened is scientifically proven, a good attitude, a positive attitude, lets you do everything better than a bad attitude will. Have you you ever gone anything with a bad attitude? Anything. And then after it's over with, it came out like you thought, an epic fail. But then you start thinking, man, if I would have Got a, had a little better attitude or tried a little harder, I probably could have made that turn out different. Has anybody ever felt that way? Your attitude is scientifically proven. The endorphins in your brain relax your body and calls up information that you know. So, and, and po- that, yeah, motivation, that positivity, yeah, yeah I've heard that before, and, but it wears off. You're exactly right, it wears off. That's why Mr. Ziegler gave you those tapes and told you to listen to them 16 times in a row before you retain it. What you feed your mind is what you are. That is a fact. And sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. <laughs> and I've done that a lot too. But what you feed your mind is what you're going to eventually put out. So educate, validate, or both. And I'm going to try to knock you guys off balance. And the last thing I want you to do, mentally off balance, not physically, Christy, so not. <laughs> I want you guys to think on a parallel track. Because I'm telling you, this information can change your life if you let it. I don't care who you are, how old you are, where you've been, and what you do. And you're going to find out that's a fact when you listen, listen to me. If you look at railroad tracks, they're just right across from each other. I want you to think of yourself right now. You've got a kickoff conference. You're coming in at the, end of a, you know, you're coming in at the very beginning of a conference. You're, gonna, you're fresh. Everybody's going to have a good time. Think about yourself and how you can apply this to yourself. Educate yourself. Validate yourself. Do both. Put that in your life. But also, I want you to think about the other track and someone else. Your kids, your spouse, your family, your mom, your dad. How can you take some of this information and pass that on to them? So let's think in parallel tracks. And if you ever stand in the middle of railroad tracks, I highly recommend it. I've done it. A rock does not derail a train, by the way. We find, everybody knows that, right? I found out personally. Look, I tried it. But at the very end, if you start looking all the way down the tracks, it looks like they come together, right? So think about yourself and how you can take this information and push it to someone else. Pretty fair? Is it fair? All right. How many of you here know without a shadow of a doubt there's something you can do in the next 14 days 
to impact yourself personally, your family, or your community in a negative way. May I see your hands, please? <laughs> Whoa, what I just do? Whoa. <laughs> How many of you here believe without a shadow of a doubt, there's 100% you know what you can do in the next 14 days to impact yourself, your family, and your community in a positive way? May I see your hands, please? A little bit better, right? How many of you believe the choice is yours? Right. I don't even understand when I say that to people and if, if they really understand that what you're saying to yourself is, or someone else, it doesn't matter about your past. I'm not even concerned with my current circumstances. There's something I can do right now, the next step, what I put in my mind, the people I associate with, the people I'm around, the direction I need to go. There's something I can do to take the right step. What's the proverb? A journey of a thousand miles starts with what? That's right. I mean, it's so crazy. And I, for so long, I've done this. And what you're about to hear from me and the things I've done, so long, I was like, man, I, I don't, I'm not going to share what I did and what happened to me because it's so unorthodox. It's so not, I mean, and my best friend, Brian Clark, said one time, he goes, man, the proof's in the pudding, brother. Look what you've done. They can't deny that. You, the, you guys here, this is one thing I want you to get out of this today. When I walk out of here, when you walk out of here today, I want you to think, if that dude can do it, I know I can do something better. Doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter how old you are, who you are, where you're from, what you've done, and your background. What's important for you is to be able to take that first step. And we're going to talk about goals. We're going to talk about four stages of growth. I talk a lot about goals. I talk a lot about attitude. And I talk a lot about four stages of growth. And the four stages of growth are survival. We've all been there. And you're there right now at some part of your life. There's seven stages of your life. Man, four, seven, one thing. Oh, you know, don't worry. This is easy. Because... The only math I know is my calculator and what percent I get, right? <laughs> I talk a lot about money sometimes. I've had money and I haven't had money. It's better to have it. <laughs> uh, it I promise you. So I'm going to talk about the survival. I'm going to talk about stability. A lot of times when we, get, we go from survival to stability, and so when you have a little security and you're stable in your life with your family, and then we go from that to success, and then from success, there's one other step, and it's called significance, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We're also going to talk about ringing the rag of significance because the seven areas of growth that you have to focus on, you have to have goals on. Four of them are yourself. Mentally, physically, personally, spiritually, and then your career, the finances, and most important, right, your family. That's all you have to focus on. And if you don't focus on those, those areas of growth, and have the right attitude, you become what I call a wandering generality. Attitude's super important. And when I talk about attitude, I always start off with little Johnny. You've heard some little Johnny jokes. Don't worry, this is not that kind. Little Johnny was a second grader. He was a very enthusiastic second grader. On Fridays, little Johnny's teacher would always say, now listen class, remember, when you go out this weekend, have a great weekend. And when you come back Monday, if you have a really good story, I'm going to let you tell it in front of the class. They took off and Monday came around and little Johnny, of course, he said fifth second to the fifth row, second to the back row. His desk was bolted down, but little Johnny wasn't. He was always like this, right, little Johnny? That was kind of me. I could put my name in there, too. I was kind of like that. Well, little, Miss, uh, little Johnny's second grade teacher said, little Johnny, it looks like you had a good weekend. Oh, yes, ma'am, I did. She goes, would you like to come tell us about it? He said, oh, yes, ma'am, I would. He hustles up to the front of the room. Little Johnny says, me and my daddy went catfishing. And we both caught, God bless you, we both caught 75 catfish each, and they all weighed 75 pounds. And little Johnny's teacher said, Johnny, you mean to tell me you and your daddy went catfishing this weekend? And you both got 75 catfish? And they always 75 pounds each? Said, oh, yes, ma'am. My dad's a good fisherman. I'm even better. <laughs> she said, Johnny, if I told you I was walking to school today and a big old 1,200-pound grizzly bear jumped out and was about to eat me, and then there was this little bitty yellow four-pound dog jumps out, grabs it by the nose, slams it down the right, slams it down the left, saves my life and kills him dead? Johnny, would you believe that? He said, oh, yes, ma'am. That's my dog. <laughs> Now, I'm not sure about Johnny's story, <laughs> but I'm sure about his attitude. That's, so it's so important. And if you look at the three words, of course, we know what, what, what it is. And I asked the question, attitude, effort, or skill. If someone was working for you, someone was working with you, or your children or your spouse, what's the most important thing? It's the attitude, right? If they have the skill in the wrong kind of attitude or they can't develop the skill, are they going to give a good effort if they don't have a good attitude? No. So it's super important to have that. 
And if you have the right kind of attitude, it opens you up to have good, to be able to, to learn the skills and you'll give the effort and that'll fall into place. Just by a quick show of hands, how many people here draw back on times of their life when they were younger, like children, a memory? Like something, when you get challenged or something hits you, do you think of something that happens back in your childhood? This is kind of my own deal. Does anybody have to do that? I wonder if I'm the only one because, I, good, I mean, some, if you're not raising your hand, it's like, okay, I see a few of those hands go up. There's stuff I, I draw back on when I was six, when I was 10. When I was 14, 18, memories are what... Now, I understand this. From zero to 103, which is how long I'm going to live, Christy? Healthy, right? You say it out loud, you're going to get it back? I think by then I'll be ready to cash it in. But I, know under, I understand that seven years old and six years old, when you're of your span of a lifetime, is not that big of a deal. But when you're seven for the first time and only time, that's your world, right? That's not a big deal. And when, when you, how many times have we as parents... Dismiss that. Your eight-year-old comes home having a bad day. Somebody picked on them. Your 14-year-old daughter has a broken heart for the first time. And we're so involved with our lives, paying the light bill. I say that a lot. That we kind of dismiss it. Oh, you don't know what real problems are. Honey, I know, you, I know it's broken now, but it'll be all right. Trust me, a year from now, you won't even care. Is that the right thing to say or the wrong thing? Right? Try to just hold your... Hold, just, when that comes, just try to hold your... Mm, all right? Just be conscious and be present of where you are. Because most people I talk about... most people I like to say that most people are wandering generalities, not a meaningful specific, and it's tough to make it as a wandering generality. John Henry Fabre was a great French nationalist. Fabre. It took me a long time to learn how to say that word. Well, he, uh, he did an experiment on processionary caterpillars. It's called the processionary caterpillar because they follow each other in a procession, right? He lined them around a flower, flower pot. And he watched them for seven days and seven nights, 24 hours a day, until they dropped dead of starvation and exhaustion. He also placed the preferred food of a processionary caterpillar. Pine needles, three inches away from them, right in the middle. So for seven days, 24 hours a day, and then they slowly dropped dead of starvation and exhaustion. But they had food right there. They confused activity with accomplishment. How many times is that me? Because <laughs> what happens is we start going to work, and when we're at work, we feel like we need to be at home. Yeah, and when we're at home, we feel like we need to be at work, and we're never anywhere. We're always chasing our tail, and especially now that we're always connected. You feeling me? And you're not ever present right there. So when that little girl, that little boy comes to you and tugs on that shoulder and you know you need to be there and you're, watching, you're playing words or you're flipping through and you don't even realize it, or we're on email, your day starts. So most of you have never heard of the name Howard Hill. He was the greatest bow hunter of all time. I'm going to give you two really good examples. Wandering generality, meaningful, specific. Howard Hill was the greatest bow hunter of all time. He killed a Cape buffalo with a bow and arrow. He killed a Bengal tiger with a bow and arrow. This old boy was good. He could draw back from 50 feet and hit a bullseye with one arrow, pull another one out, split that one. Pretty good, right? I'm going to tell you something right now. I could whoop Howard Hill any day of the week. Remember you telling about that positive attitude? You don't want me taking your tonsils out? That's if you put a blindfold on Howard Hill, spun him around a time or two. And every time I say that, people's like, they look at me like, Michael, you're crazy. How do you expect... A man to hit a target he can't even see? That's a pretty good question. And I have one for you. How can you hit a target you do not have? Are you going to go to work tomorrow because that's what you did yesterday? If you go to work tomorrow just because that's what you did yesterday, you'll never be any closer to the goal that you don't have because you'll be two days older and no goals, right? It's really simple. Do you know they say 97% of Americans do not write their goals down? How many people here feel like they're goal-oriented? Yeah. They say 97% of people don't write their goal down. 80% of people are problem solvers. We're not goal-oriented. So that's awesome. I'm going to tell you right here, 100% of you people have written a goal down in its simplest form. Anybody ever do a to-do list? Right. On your piece of paper, on your cell phone, on your computer... 
you know, on the, on the envelope, on the back of the mail, on the bill I hadn't paid yet in, the, in my truck when I'm driving, right? We've done that. It's a sim- in its simplest form. I'm going to tell you really quick. I'm going to have some really good takeaways here. We've got uh, the MTV cameras here, and plus we've got our guys filming it, so we'll be able to get this somewhere uh, somehow. But when you review this, we do a lot of training on goal setting, leadership training, uh, sales training. So uh, I'm going to tell you really easy. Here's where you are. Here's where you want to go and define the gap. It's pretty simple, right? This is where we are. This is what we want to be, where we want to go, and you define the gap. What's cool is it's a formula, and you can do it over and over and over and over again. So and when you define the gap, because we're not goal-oriented people, we're problem-oriented people, we're good at pro- solving problems, the gap are the problems. And you, you compartmentalize, slow down, Michael, you're fired up here, compartmentalize the goals and the problems, the problems turn into obstacles. The obstacles then turn into stepping stones on how you reach your goal. Sound pretty simple? That's pretty cool, right? But I, every time, I, any kind of coaching I do, when I do coaching, they say, man, I can only see this one big, huge thing right here. There's a lot of white space, but that first one. Well, the rule is a simple one. You go as far as you can go, and then when you get there, you'll, you'll be able to see further. Does that make sense? But you got to trust the process. Our process in selling, our process in leadership, our process in everything is trust. And when you break trust, you spend a lifetime getting it back sometimes, and sometimes you can't. Character is the ability to carry out a task long after the excitement of the moment's gone. I'm six years old. I bring a little flyer home. My mom and dad just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, and I'm just now 26. They got a lot. Yeah, I'm high five to them too, right? They made it. I'm the reason they started. <laughs> yeah, I think it's cool now, but when I first heard it, when I was 14, me and my brother were fighting. He's 18 months younger than me. And we're like, blah, 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 arguing back and forth. He goes, well, at least mom and dad wanted me. I was like, what does that mean? My mom's over there, and she, she looks up, and I'm looking at her. She goes, you didn't know that, uh, hmm. <laughs> so I'm not kidding. I took off out of there. I'm going to give you some killer advice. I run my companies just like I run my families. And my mom is amazing. She was 15 years old when she got pregnant with me. 16 when she got married. I'm six years old. I come flying home and I got a flyer. And it's about playing football. But you got to understand, I I love football. Still to this day, it's my first love. But I was a little runt. I said, Mom, I want to play football. She said, okay. We'll talk to your dad when you get home. I went to my dad. He's like, all right. Sign up for next week. And he was hoping I'd forget. Next week came, and guess what? I was right in front of him. Here we go. They went and talked for a second, huddled up. And then we headed up, to, we headed up to the tryouts. I went and to sign up. Six years old, right? Remember this, six years old. I still draw back on it this day. The first time I ever remember feeling rage, like so mad I wanted to just tear somebody's head off. The, the coach looks around at my dad at the little... Eight-foot table up there at the, the sign-ups on the baseball field, which would turn into a football field. He said, he looks like he's a little small. You might want to bring him back next year. And I felt it. Come, I, felt, I felt this heat come here up the back of my head, up into my eyeballs, and my eyeballs swole up, and I wanted to start crying, but not because I felt sad, because I was pissed, excuse my language. I was upset. My old dad looks back, and he, I guess he saw me, and he goes, well, here's the money to check, and we'll be back. So I hit the front door. My mom's doing dishes. Remember, 21 at the time, no high school degree. She had just learned how to uh, do wigs. <laughs> Back then, there was, she was big, people were big on wigs, I guess. So she was doing wigs in the house. People would come over and drop their wigs off. So she's doing dishes. And I come flying, hustling back to the deal. And she knew how excited I was. She said, hey, what happened? Whoa, whoa, whoa. And I stepped back. And she said, how'd it go? And I'm right here. And she's doing dishes. And think about the helicopter parents today. I'm not going to get into millennial communication because you got a great guy coming in tomorrow. I won't jump in. We do a lot of generational communication stuff. But think about this. She's washing dishes. How'd it go? No, she's washing dishes. She's looking at me. And then she never looks back. And I said, that coach told me I was too small. She's a mama, right? And she didn't even look up. And I asked her later. I said, do you remember that? She said, yeah. I said, what'd you think? I thought he was right. <laughs> <laughs> You were too small. And he did hurt my baby's feelings. And I wanted to go grab him and take him out behind the woodshed and whip his, you know what? I wanted to call him right then and say, and I wanted to grab you and say, it's okay, baby. We'll find you something else to do. 
Nah, she didn't flinch. Here's what she said. She said, what do you think? She kept doing her deal. And I just went, I think he's wrong. Well, that's all that matters. What? Is that not awesome? Tell me that just didn't give you chills right there a little bit. A mother who, un- uneducated country girl, we lived in West, West Texas, a little west of Wichita Falls. I mean, the poverty line, depending on the price of the oil, is where the community I grew up in. <laughs> yeah, and so that's why we moved to Oak Cliff, Texas, and then my dad went to work at General Motors. We never really went with that, but we never had anything, right? It was just the way it was. That time, if she would have pulled me in and said, okay, oh, we'll find something else for you to do, call the coach. I talked to that coach, Michael. He's going to play you. What would have happened to me? Then I would have known I could go behind, behind her skirt, right? How powerful is that? As parents today, it's so hard for us not to want to do it for them. And now, you know, the helicopter parents, talking about, they t- they're calling them lawnmower parents for Generation Z now because they want everything so flat and smooth. Come on, honey. They're lawnmower. They're just mowing everything down for you. We're not going to have that problem. So that right there, I still draw back. In my, and my mom, what's really cool about it, she used it further in life. When I'm 12 years old, struggling with a coach or a parent or anything, she goes, well, you remember that one time? Because by the third game, you were starting, and you were the smallest guy on the team, and you were a little tackle, and you were so cute. And I was like, that was cool, not cute. Come on. But she flew. She drew back on that moment. I've drawn back on that moment. I'm a second grader, seven years old. See, I'm going to go through all the way up to my 40s. We'll get there, guys. We'll see. We'll be all right. I'm in school. I'm successful on the football field, successful on the playground. I'm the runt, though, and I never thought about that. She just said, oh, you're a girl. Don't worry about it. And I said, well, that's what happened. I did. I was five foot when I was a freshman, six foot when I graduated, and then grew in college a couple inches. I'm in class. I'm like little Johnny. I'm sitting back at the back, and I'm always vibrating a little bit. And the teacher, have y'all ever had this happen? I need you to read the first paragraph, you read the second paragraph, and you read the third, and we'll just go all the way around the class. Y'all remember that? Did you ever do that? Millennials? There's a couple in here. All right, so be careful. Right? So I had no problem. We were just learning how to read. I think we were seven. I got to me, and I stumbled and stammered through my little paragraph, and Miss Ridley, ooh, she's like the little rascal's teacher. She had a little hair growing out right there. She's, <laughs> I mean, I just see this now to now. now. Nowadays, I just see that picture. I hustle up to the front. She grabs, hands me her book. She said, read that paragraph again. I read that paragraph. I got up there and read it. I stumbled and staggered through it again. And she said, I swear, Michael, you're as dumb as a box of rocks. Bam. See, and the exact same thing happened, what happened in here. Some giggles, some chuckles, some gasp, and some people felt sorry for me. You guys are just my classmates. So what was I for the rest of my life when I walked into school building? Dumb as a box of rocks. I saw you mouth it there. Even if you had asked me to read something today, <laughs> right now, I've learned to do this, pass. <laughs> but not until I was out of college. So what did it teach me to do? It taught me to cheat, unfortunately. <laughs> but it also taught me a lot of really cool things. It taught me how to communicate. It taught me how to read people. It taught me how to sit by the smartest girl in the class <laughs> and build rapport and build good relationships. It put me outside of a box immediately. Now, what I was was dyslexia, which is really dysgraphia. When you look at it, it turns craziness, right? I have a son. My, my daughter's 25 years old, graduated uh, a couple years ago. My son's 23, and he has dyslexia. And when Carrie and I were really trying to survive and struggling in class, and when he was in fourth grade, we had a call from our overpriced, she's in the room, and I'll look at her, overpriced <laughs> uh, college prep school, right? Uh, it was an uh, elementary school. And my daughter was doing really well. They called me in one day, the principal, and he and I knew each other very well because I was always late paying the fee. <laughs> And we struggled with that. We were survival mode. And he says, uh, we're going to have to, you now think about my mom and think about me. I don't think I handle it as good as she did. We're gonna, we want Trent, Trent, my son, um, he's going to have to leave and not go to school here anymore. I was like, sweet. <laughs> I don't know how, just only have one tuition to pay every month when they're in fourth grade. And I, so what's the problem? Well, he needs to go to a public school where they have special needs programs for special needs children like him. Do you realize what you're calling, my son? Do you know I'm going to come over that desk right now and hurt you? <laughs> Seriously. I had that same, whew, like I was six years old again. And I, my wife there, and she, my wife's a, tr- a teacher by trade. 
We left. I mean, it was, <sighs> turns out he has dyslexia. We don't have time to get into the whole story. But I will tell you this. Uh, they told me, Michael, think about that. You, there's, there's a, they have systems now to work with. They have strategies. It's dyslexia. He, he'll be okay. So what I did, what taught me how to cheat, taught him how to excel. Sitting in front of the class. Use your strategies. When was it? June? June of this year, he graduated 3.2 two-sport athlete from college. Yeah, thank you. Pay raise, pay raise, pay raise, right? I'm very proud of that. You happen to know Trent, so uh, that was awesome. And I can tell you right now, it's because of his attitude. Because my parents told me back in the day when six and seven, you can do anything you want. Because when I, because my dad had a very different conversation when he was taking me to practice the first day. He said, "Listen, son, you can you can play this, but you're not going to quit. Now you can stop playing at the end of the year, and that's not quitting. That's retiring." <laughs> But you're going to finish. So they told me, you can do anything you want as long as you're willing to put the work in. Pretty simple, right? That's awesome. My daughter, Mrs. Overachiever, Presley. You talk about the will of life. She graduated in, in uh, four years. 29% of college students in America graduate in four years. Only 29%. Pretty impressive, right? I'm proud of her. I'm telling you that for two reasons. Because in my son's story, so bragging on my kids in front of y'all. And I can also tell you the good stories from them, too. This is something right here that's powerful, too. She graduated 29% of the class, Miss Overachiever, Miss Captain of Everything She Ever Did, Miss Who's Who, Miss Princess Homecoming Thing, and Miss uh, Prom Queen. This girl walks in a room and dominates. Her charisma is out of control good, right? And she's a really good leader and all this stuff. She gets into school, and she goes through four years. She gets out. She gets her degree. Her and her mom high-five each other because guess what? The reason Carrie and I started our life, same reason my mom and dad did. <laughs> I have a little nine-year-old now. We were joking about it. And everybody goes, oh, that's just an accident. Ooh, yeah. No, nah, she's the only one I planned. <laughs> the other two were the accidents. <laughs> or the uh-oh, I don't know. Nothing was an accident, it turns out. So Presley gets out of school, and we're all excited, and she even takes a job. She even says, I'm going to move back home for 12 months because I want to be with my sister and develop that relationship. I'm loving that. She's back home for a little bit, right? For a little bit. Don't get crazy. And she didn't, and she was, believe me, she wants to get out on her own. She didn't, she's a speech pathologist, but she couldn't find a job in that, so she took a job as a PR person, which is perfect for her, and she was grinding. Here's what I told her. I said, don't worry about paying me anything. Just save half your paycheck. You're not used to getting any money anyway. Save half of it. When you get ready to move out in here, you'll be fine. I raised my, I run my companies like I raised my kids. Because when my kid would fall, come back in, Trent, don't climb that tree. It might hurt. He climbed the tree anyway, and he'd fall, and he needs a Band-Aid, right? Who's he come to then? Me. I see him climb the tree. I let him climb it anyway. Nowadays, the helicopter parents and the lawnmower parents, ooh, don't even climb that tree. Because it's not, trust me, it's going to hurt. So my daughter goes out. And I tell Carrie this. She's here. She can, she's going to attest to this. I said, I'm seeing a lot of UPS, a lot more UPS, a lot more Amazon coming to the front door. <laughs> So she's getting these, she's spending her money and she committed to move out with her friends. About 18 months later, she went longer than she wanted to. She came to me upset and crying and she says, I don't have enough money to move out. What am I going to do now? I've already committed to it, sign the lease and it's going to do it. And I said, well, let's just take it, take it back a second. It's okay. Let's look at the wheel of life. From zero to one, I want you to rate yourself financially, physically, your career, your family, uh, your mental health, your spiritual, you know, just, just. This is Miss Overachiever, right? Always been really good. I walk out of the room. I come back three or four minutes later. And right when she's finishing up, a big old crocodile tear. Bam. She said, I'm such a failure. She's always overachieved. And she didn't understand, shame on me, failure is an event, not a person. You guys hear that? So many times we get beat down. We feel like we're the, we're the, we're the problem, right? Failure's an event. I said, Presley, look what you did in high school. Look what you've done in college. That doesn't count. What do you mean it doesn't count? I still draw back on when I was in Little League football, right? I count us. Because why does it count? Because that's the arena you were placed in. That's the pond you were playing in, and you excelled to the top percentile. You have to understand that, and when you get put in another place, you play. You compete. Now, where was she then? She was 11 again. She had a broken heart. She had a skinned knee. And who was getting to put the Band-Aid on it? Me. And she was off what? Balance. So she was open for learning and what? Retention. And who was the hero? Me. <laughs> That's always a benefit, right? 
But we have to let ourselves skin our knee. You have to take your shot. That's super, super important. I want you to get to know this deal. I'm living my dream and I'm in college. I'm t- early 20s. My, my wife followed me to college. I'm playing football, cheating my way into school. I got a pretty smart girl to cheat off of. <laughs> and I'm playing. I'm in Iowa on a recruiting visit. I call home on the payphone. You don't know what that is, I know. I had my eight quarters. You put the eight quarters in the slot and you get two minutes. <laughs> right? I call her up, and have you ever played this with your spouse or with your loved one? you ever play what's wrong, nothing game? Yeah. What's wrong, nothing? What's wrong, nothing? I'm having a great day. What's wrong? What's wrong? Okay. My two minutes is about to be up, and I'm not calling you back. (laughs) And you got to understand, when Carrie and I were dating, she was from, her parents were very well off, and I was from the not very well off. Okay? And her mom and dad loved me. I got more stuff at Christmas than she did. It was awesome. (laughs) Her parents bought me a little... So they bought them, had a Suburban, and they traveled all over the podunk towns to watch me play at my little, little college thing. It was, it was awesome. So then she tells, I call her back, collect. So she, <laughs> I won, right? I call her back, collect. I said, what's wrong? Nothing, what's wrong? And then she gives me, I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. Have you ever seen the cartoon character, smoke, eyes pop out, smoke comes out of his ears, and all your body parts fall for that long, I mean for just that long, I pulled the phone away and I was that, I mean that happened to me. Then I picked the phone up and I swear to her, I said, don't worry about it. We're going to do whatever it takes. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I hung up. <laughs> no. I had the longest, before cell phones, before social media, before constant contact, I was already in survival mode. Have you ever been there? We're all there somewhere in our life with our, with our relationships, with our finances, with the people we're with. I was in survival. I get home, and as soon as I get home, I go straight to it. I run upstairs, and I grab her, and I open the door. I open the door to grab her, and she's crying like, <laughs> like that crying. Have you ever cried like that? I mean, like, oh, I didn't know what happened. I didn't know if it was something happened to the baby, something happened to her. What's going on? And I told her on the phone, I said, whatever you do, don't tell your parents <laughs> until I get there. Well, guess what? She told her parents. So I said, okay, no problem. What did they say? She said, they said, if I marry you for the rest of my life, I'll have to buy my clothes at Walmart. (laughs) You can ask her. And here's what I said. What's wrong with that? (laughs) I want to tell you something right now. That was the wrong thing to say to that woman at that time. I mean, it was the rest of the night we talked between the door. (laughs) But I'll tell you something, what you draw back on in your life, because I made a commitment right then, because myself, me personally, I don't need money back then. I had three streams of revenue when I was 10. Totally different talk, but I did. I mean, if I ever need money, I go out and sell it. All I need then, all I needed back then was enough money for a six-pack of beer and a 12-pack of tacos. I mean, something like that, back and forth, but that's all it was. If I had $5 and you needed three of it, you could have it. I could always go make money. I never even meant, the money didn't mean anything to me. But right then, I told myself, right then, I vowed, right then, you will never have to buy your clothes at Walmart. So I spent my 20s proving my in-laws exactly right. (laughs) This is where it gets pretty dark. Three failed businesses. Two homes foreclosed on. I know what it's like to have to go park your truck over at the Piggly Wiggly so the repo guy doesn't steal it. And walk home, two cars repossessed. And it it was, you're right, I could generate the money, but I hadn't built the foundational skills and developed the methodology yet to do the right things with the money and not bring it home when you're building it. And I kept losing it. So she was like this, 31 divorce papers, bam. Mr. Mr. Zig Ziglar spoke to 80 to 100,000 people. And when they got up there, he was, looked good, he dressed good, beautiful wife, hung out with the rich people, had a lot of money. And then he started telling you about, he was 45 before he got paid to speak. He was broken in debt at 45. He, had to, he, he lost a home, sold his furniture, all the things he had done. So he gives you hope, right? So at that time, when I was early 20s, I was at a garage sale, backing up just a little bit. I got ahead of myself, and I was at a garage sale, and I was going through this garage sale, and I was trying to buy baby clothes for Presley. She was on her way, right? I had $8 in my pocket. 
spent five of it, couldn't talk the guy, the guy down for baby clothes. So I said, well, you got to throw in these uh, hairband tapes. I was a child from the 80s, party in the back, business in the front, don't kid yourself. You know what I'm talking about. So I looked down, I got a cassette tape. You know what that is, don't act like you don't. Cassette tape, and it said Zig Ziglar. I figured, oh, that's a rock band, I'm good with that. <laughs> I popped that sucker in, and he said things like, fear is an event, not a person. And I'm talking about a life when every, I'm by myself, I'm alone, no hope, unemployable, dumb as a box of rocks. Cheated my way through college, had no, no skill. You can have everything in life you want if you'll help enough other people get what they want. So I lived it. I own six companies right now. And I'm telling you, God has shown favor on me that would, you, would be it's out of control. But I did not develop the skill, like I said, yet to be able to hold on to that money. Now we have. Because at 31, when I was handed divorce papers, my to-do list has turned into a win-now list. And if you want to set goals, you leave here today and you change your to-do list because how successful are your to-do lists every day in a day out? Do they get longer or shorter most time? They get longer, right? Because a budget, a home budget looks awesome. To-do list looks awesome. And then as soon as you do that, you step right outside of the door. And this is what I did that changed my life. I have day runners and day planners back then. They still have those and people still use them. But now we should use what? This, your device. But these day planners are still important. And I go back and look at them. I found them from 2001, 2002, 2004. I found a little briefcase. We were digging out the garage. And the front of that thing says, be a better husband. Get Carrie back. Be a better dad. It says those things. Let me tell you something right now. What kept Carrie and I married sometimes? This is reality, and it's not big pie in the sky, fluffy uh, unicorn and all kind of stuff. Another man tucking my kids into bed at night Kept me, kept me coming back when she served me divorce papers. Having children is the most unconditional love you'll experience on this earth, in my opinion. Because when I failed over and over again, I came home and she and I were each other's throats. When that little girl, when that little boy could get up right up in here, there's nothing like that. So what, we, what you need to do, do me a favor, if you take nothing away from this, take this, win now. Take your win now list. I'm over five minutes. I so apologize. It's okay. You win now. This is what I'm going to wrap up with. What's important now? No other way. That's where I was. I took a step. And some days all I could do was get up and take that step. But every time I walked out the door and everything pulled me different ways and different directions, you know what I went back on? I went back on that win now list. People start talking to me. And instead, at the end of the day, going back to my list, during the day, go back and say, well, i got to win now. Where is it? Win. What's important right now? No other way. We have no other way to be, to be successful. Those are your goals. That's where you, you're here. You want to be here. You define the gap. The gap turns into the, pro, the stumbling box, which turns into the stepping stones. That makes us happy. Real quick, four years ago, we sold a company for generational money. I always said I'm going to be able to retire when I was 40. That didn't happen. <laughs> I was 44. Thank you very much. We made generational money. We had sold the company. We had signed it, but the money hasn't hit the bank yet. And I'm having to fly around the country and do my little dog and pony show to get these guys uh, to, to get them onboarded. So I'm in L.A., and I always fly like shorts and flip-flops, and I was hustling, and I got back to put what my little girl calls my big boy clothes on. And she doesn't like me when I have to wear big boy clothes. She goes, you don't look right, you know, because she's expecting me different. So, and I get there, and I start unpacking. I get dressed for that morning to go do all my meetings, and I forget my socks. <clears throat> So I'm dressed like this with no socks on, and I'm going, I'm doing my meeting, and then at lunch, I, have to, I was going to go at lunch and get socks. Well, here's what happened. I got a call right before my last meeting, and the banker says, hey, man, guess what? My congratulations, the wire just hit. Oh, my gosh. And of course, he said, if you need anything, let me know. Because <laughs> he's been there through the tough times. He said, I have walked in and said, hey, man, do me a favor. I'm going to have him cash these checks at the liquor store. So I get, you know, he knows everything we've been through. I called Carrie. She didn't answer I said, call me back, it finally hit, we did it. And I go to the store and I jump in, I buy my socks. And right when I check it out, I'm walking out of the field. And she calls and she answers and I say, she goes, oh my gosh, that's great. We're crying, she's crying, I'm crying. She goes, where are you? My first purchase where I could buy anything I wanted anywhere. Walmart. (laughs) She laughed, I laughed. Her parents kind of like me now. And today, she, Walmart's a genius because they have this app. You can scan all your receipts. She still shops at Walmart. And we go in for 
paper towels and Walmart makes you scan stuff and get points. She gets points. She's better with money than I am. <laughs> it's crazy. There's three types of motivation in life. Do it or you're fired. Fear. We've all been there and it works for a little bit. There's incentive motivation. Donkey and the carrot. You hate the donkey and the carrot. Eventually the donkey eats so much carrot you can't make it big enough or sweet enough. And then there's a third piece. It's when you can tie what you do to what your passion is. That's innate. That's driven. And when we go from stability or struggling, survival, to stability and security, and then security to success, that next piece, what is, what is success to you? I don't know what success is. Do you have to tell me that? House, vacation home, money, kids college paid for, whatever that is, whatever it looks like for you. But significance. It's when you're not a wandering generality, you're meaningful, specific, because you have things written down, you're driving towards that, I want to impact generations in my family. We've been able to do that. But significance is when you can have someone, you can help other people be, do, and have more. Because I'll promise you this, God will rest my soul, but my spirit will live on in the people that I impact. That's what's going to happen to us. It's up to us to ring the rag everywhere we are, right here, right now, this day, next door in your, your deal, tonight when you talk to your kids, your wife, your spouse, when you go on this weekend, when you're working, I mean, put it all in there. Because if you die today, this is what I, like my brother say, a little bit of me goes a long way. <laughs> but if you die today, not, not what you'll, take, but what stories die with you? What did you not leave on the table? Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. I'm so sorry I took so long. You just the <laughs> I tried to wrap it up quick. Appreciate you. So y'all join us in Grand Ballroom 6 through 8 for our opening reception. And at 7.30 in the morning, Dr. Rob Dietz, our chief economist with the National Association of Home Builders, will be our breakfast keynote. Welcome to the conference.